It is very difficult to find the words or an image to describe the pain and disorientation of one sister simply disappearing without trace for 20 years. It's a bit like trying to search for a body which is trapped somewhere beneath the frozen Arctic Ocean as the freeze continues and the ice thickens and there is no sign of a thaw, no sign of a seal hole. The features of that world become distorted as the seasons pass and the ice builds up and you have to go inside to get warm if you want to survive and carry on. But you have to be ready for the thaw, for the rescue. Somewhere inside I became disconnected from the past and disabled by the future. The mountain seems to be gashed open. Lying on my front on one bank of dry peat, I am gazing into a silent seeping and simmering of peat, moss, water, sky and grass, disturbing in its atavistic delta rhythm. Is there any sign of the birth of a river? It seems to be an inexplicable, pre-germinal, formless place. If I put a foot wrong, it could swallow me and pickle my flesh for centuries. The larks, the sheep and the buzzards have gone silent. A bubble rises so slowly with defiance from the depth of the black pool edged by stagnant moss. Two more appear and then, within the stillness, sounds the song of a lark in the distance. Now, on the surface of the pool where the bubbles vanished, there is the faint swirl of a current, a welling up. Now, the sun brightens. It traces a capillary of water, pushing aside the waterlogged spring grass. The trickle casts an imprint of forked lightning onto the greenness. The sun was shining softly, an early morning light so gentle, stroking the earth and the trees. I felt ashamed that I have damaged my own architecture. I cried and found myself praying for forgiveness as I walked along the track between an avenue of beech trees. Speaking is uncomfortable, as is learning about silence and the value of the mouth as a passage for sound, music, food and kisses. Secrets live like hungry ghosts inside us. They live on fistfuls of fear. Their mouths gape, their hair-thin necks crane beneath our skin, etiolated. Their bellies stretched and empty. They are not gagged, but they gag us, choke, wretch, strangle, suffocate us. They warp our blood like cancer, a blood which has holes in it, gaps. They keep us from knowing who we are. They shadow us, lurk under rock, fill our bellies with stones, constipate our lives. They keep us safe in their power not to disclose. They silence our song. They drain us with their longing to be told. When is the right time to pierce the skin and erupt the pus the blood. Blood full of holes passes on to the next generation. When the iceberg melts, the mass of ice gets lighter and this form rises up out of the sea with its rings. 
It was as if the huge necessary melting within me was glinting in the ring of the iceberg. Sometimes I heard the sound of the sun moving, of ice dissolving into water, an ominous creaking, a melting, a lightening. I decided to stay with the discipline of sitting and let it happen. The tears and mucus began to pour out of my eyes and nose. Where did all that liquid come from? How many bowls would it fill? My face became wet, coated with tears and snot which dripped off my jaw. Then my whole body began to tremble and there was a heat of energy circulating and being released as my body quivered with life. It felt like a purifying fire coming up within, balancing the wetness on my face. It was as if there were a purging by fire and water. There was nothing else to do but to remain within this massive stillness. I felt like an ancient rock sitting through the fluctuating seasons, years, centuries. From a tightening, a narrowing, the eye of a needle, to a great opening, from a constricted, sore throat to speech. What needed to be reclaimed and acknowledged rushed through like a spring flood gushing into a water meadow, bringing renewal. Its pace was sure and unfaltering. Some people said that Lucy had a hand in writing it. Lucy, four months after you disappeared, I had the first dream. You had returned and I asked you where you had been. You said, I've been sitting in a water meadow. Then slowly, with a smile, you said, If you sit very still, you can hear the sun move. It has remained deeply significant and real. Did you speak to me from there? When he was three years old, my son Jack came into our bed one morning and said, You know that dream we had last night? He then told me in great detail about our dream. I wonder, is there a place where we all share the same dream? Is that the place where what has been dismembered can be remembered? Is it the place where you can hear the sun move? One day, when Lucy was nine years old, she walked around the edge of a field, gathering raw sheep's wool from the hedges. Then she carried it back to our home and carefully transformed it into a little woven bag. The whole process must have taken days of intense concentration, patience and a determination to follow an idea through in practice. It speaks of her gentleness and her generosity and her desire to get back to first principles. Lucy gave the bag to me it is one of my most treasured possessions. There is a place that understands deep within that violence can only breed more violence and that this is where it must stop. It is not a place where justice means more pain, punishment and revenge. It is rooted in a strong instinct for this depth of pain not to happen to anyone else. The rawness of this wound somehow strips away all that is unimportant. 
the deepest reality of what it means to be human is laid bare. It is a place of insight which opens up to learning, hope and compassion. It is a place that yearns for healing, which is willing to sacrifice the immediate response of revenge. It says I know, even right now, in the rawness of this pain and horror, that I am still alive, alive in a way that I have never been alive before, alive to possibilities, human possibilities, divine possibilities, that there is another way forward that may bring healing to the world. It wants to say, just wait, stay with the pain, let it burn you into a place of renewal. I am always struck and moved by people who have tried to speak out from this place. One day I was sitting in my hut, holding Lucy's little woven bag and praying about my work with the Forgiveness Project. I remembered Lucy using thorns to extract thorns from the mess of the raw fleece. Somehow the bag felt alive, as if it had work to do. I began to take it with me into prisons and hand it around as I told our story. It was her gift to me and now it is shared with others as something to hold and contemplate. The feeling that comes from holding Lucy's little bag is quietly spreading. Softly, the spirit that delights to do no evil is truly at work in the realms of forgiving. Once, I witness a man in Haidan prison gazing lovingly at the bag, marvelling and not wanting to let go of it and pass it on. He later told me that he didn't usually have experiences like this, but when he had looked at the bag as it rested between his palms, there seemed to be light pouring out of it. Many hands have treasured the little woollen bag, feeling the gentleness, aspiration and hope that it embodies. Many whose hands are stained and clenched by violence, deceit, betrayal, greed, jealousy, hatred and ignorance. Many whose hands long to be put to good use, to be valued, who long to be free from shame, have been touched by its simple power. This little woven bag carries something of the generosity and lightness of Lucy's spirit in its wake. Almost all who have been touched by Lucy's life, her disappearance and her terrible death have been enlarged in some way, have known a deepening of love. This is truly more enduring than the horror surrounding the unspeakable physical trauma. It is as mysterious as the dreams that guided me and the words that arrived. It is embodied in the root of her name, Lucy. Light to shine, that which is bright. Things are as big as you make them. I can fill a whole body, a whole day of life with worry about a few words on one scrap of paper. Yet, the same evening, looking up, can frame my fingers to fit the sky in my cupped hands. Lucy Partington, 1952 to 1973